Welcome to Revolutionary Secrets, Cryptology in the American Revolution. In this episode, we're looking at steganography, and in this last part, we'll be talking about invisible inks. The use of invisible ink was not new at the time of the American Revolution. Giovanni Battista Porta included several recipes for secret inks in his writings in the late 16th century. The practice of invisible writing was often included in cryptologic skills until World War II, when the technique fell more under the auspices of covert operations than cryptographic methods. But during the Revolutionary War, it was used by American patriots, British loyalists, spies, and traitors. The Second Continental Congress created the Committee of Correspondence on November 29, 1775. It was quickly renamed the Committee of Secret Correspondence. It was renamed again two years later as the Committee of Foreign Affairs. Among its many duties, the committee employed secret agents abroad, conducted covert operations, and created methods for secret communication. In the spring of 1776, the Committee of Secret Correspondence appointed Silas Dean, a Connecticut delegate to the Continental Congress, as a secret agent in France. He was to pose as a Bermudan merchant selling Indian goods, but he was tasked with making clandestine purchases and gaining secret assistance from the French crown. Benjamin Franklin recommended that Dean contact Edward Bancroft near London. Bancroft previously acted as a spy for Franklin, and Franklin believed he would be willing to supply information concerning the British again. Bancroft met Dean on July 8, 1776. Dean revealed the true purpose of his visit. He even took Bancroft with him to a meeting with the French foreign minister. Shortly after meeting with Dean, Bancroft returned to England. A British agent and former American knew of Bancroft's trip and convinced him to meet with William Eden, chief of the British Intelligence Service. By this time, Bancroft had lived in England for 10 years and now believed the colonies should not be separated from Britain. Thus, he was open to Eden's urgings to work as a double agent, maintaining his contact with the Americans in France and reporting back to the British. Silas Dean and later Benjamin Franklin gave Bancroft full access to American negotiations with France. They even hired him as their secretary and unknowingly put a spy on the payroll. In this position, Bancroft copied all the instructions sent to the American commissioners from the Continental Congress, as well as U.S. correspondence with the French foreign minister. His method of communication to the British involved invisible ink. He took his letters to a dead drop inside the hollow roots of a tree, where they were retrieved and taken to the British embassy. The British ambassador had the formula to develop the hidden ink, revealing its secrets. Much of the information Bancroft provided to Britain pertained to military supplies and shipments from France to America and the progress of the French-American Treaty. The Americans did try to keep their official correspondence secret, at least from others outside their quarters. Dean, John Adams, and Ben Franklin used invisible ink and ciphers. Dean used an invisible ink made from a compound of cobalt chloride, glycerin, and water. The reactivation agent was heat. Franklin and Adams more commonly used ciphers to encrypt their messages. George Washington liked invisible ink and was given a supply by Dr. James Jay. Jay, a physician born in New York, moved to England in 1762, but remained loyal to his homeland. Before the outbreak of the war, Jay realized a secret form of communication was needed. After much experimentation, he came upon a mixture. It was a two-part solution. One chemical acted as the invisible ink, and another made it visible. The exact recipe for Jay's invisible ink is lost to history but because it required a reactivation agent, it was a more secure method than Dean's ink that could be revealed with heat. George Washington had his spies use Jay's invisible ink. In this message to Benjamin Talmadge, the chief of the spy network known as the Culper Spy Ring, Washington says, All the white ink I now have, or indeed any prospect of getting soon, is sent in vial number one by Colonel Webb. The liquid in number two is the counterpart, which renders the other visible by wetting the paper with a fine brush after the first has been used and is dry. You will send these to Culper Jr. as soon as possible. I beg that no mention may ever be made of your having received such liquids from me or anyone else. He says the secrecy is necessary and acknowledges that British Major Benjamin Tryon has something similar and it may lead to detection if it is ever known that a matter of this sort has passed from me. In the second paragraph, Washington specifies the information that he would like Culper Jr. to gather from New York City. The Culpers did make use of the invisible ink, along with codes and ciphers. It's difficult to see in this image, but it used the sympathetic stain, as invisible ink was sometimes called. 
Washington encouraged his spies to use the ink to write in the margins or the blank end pages of a book to alleviate the suspicion that might be associated with a note. Culper Jr. preferred to use a blank paper and hide it within a stack of blank pages. If stopped by the British, the courier, a tavern owner, could claim the ream of paper was simply stock for his business. However, in this case, the information was too important to delay gathering supplies for the tavern and was written at the end of an ordinary-looking note. To avoid suspicion, the letter was addressed to Colonel Floyd, a known Tory. If the British stopped the courier and read the note, it simply stated that the requested supplies were not available and that they'd be sent as soon as they could be acquired. The true information that Washington needed was written in invisible ink below Culper's signature. On the actual document, the faint writing can still barely be seen today. The invisible message relayed the crucial information that the British had gathered 8,000 troops from New York City and sailed to the north side of Long Island. The British, aware of the imminent arrival of the French fleet at Newport, hoped to stop their disembarking. With this new information, General Washington debated what he could do. He knew, as did General Henry Clinton, that the reduction of forces in New York City left the city vulnerable. Though Washington wanted to take the opportunity to attack, he knew his troops were too few to succeed. However, all Washington had to do was stop Clinton from moving to Rhode Island. He marched his troops toward New York in a feint to draw Clinton's attention. Washington's ruse worked. Clinton called back his troops to protect New York City from an attack that would never come. And thus the French fleet's arrival in Newport went unchallenged. Washington then began to make plans to join forces with the French fleet for a real attack on New York City. Try this revolutionary activity. Make your own invisible ink. Mix one teaspoon of baking soda in a quarter cup of hot tap water. This is not an exact recipe and you can use more or less baking soda if you like. Use a toothpick, small paintbrush, or a cotton swab as your pen. If you're using a cotton swab, you might want to pull off some of the cotton so that your lines are thinner. Dip it in the ink and write your message. You may have to re-dip it off every two or three letters, especially if you're using a toothpick. Let it dry. This takes time, so don't be impatient. Use a different paintbrush or cotton swab dipped in 100% red grape juice as your reactivation agent. You can leave all the cotton on the cotton swab this time. Paint it over your paper and your message should reappear. If it doesn't, more grape juice usually doesn't help. It usually means that you need more baking soda in your water. Have fun! Thank you for watching our episode on steganography in the Revolutionary War. And for watching all of our episodes. If you haven't seen the, our episodes on ciphers, codes, or visual signaling, I encourage you to check them out. They all played a role in America's War for Independence. I'm Jennifer Wilcox. Thanks for joining me.